Okay. We have the love of the brethren that we're going to be talking about. And you might say, not again. John's always talking about love here. You know, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm a slave to the Scriptures. The Scriptures keep coming back to it over and over and over again, so I have to keep coming back to it over and over and over again because basically... When we look across the church today, we do not find that the love of God is that prominent in our churches. I'm thankful that it is here. But I'm th- we, we need to excel all the more as we find out in the scripture here. The First Thessalonians 4, 9, it says this. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. I could almost change this really quick here. As to the love of the brethren, you have no one to preach to you. You ought to have no one to preach to you. For you yourselves are taught from God by himself. He himself teaches you that you love one another. Now, why is it that Scripture comes back to this over and over again? It's because God comes back to it over and over again. Jesus Christ came into this world. Remember the song, the, the John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God started the ministry of Jesus because he loved mankind. And it is understandable that his call to us is to come to him for this salvation, but then after we receive that salvation that we ought to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked, that we might be able to redeem this world as Jesus came to redeem it, that we might be vessels of redemption to this world. He's given us a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling man to God, and also reconciling man to one another. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus spells it out very clear to us. That is the command of his, this is what we are all about. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the mark of our life as believers. No wonder the scripture comes back to it over and over again, and your crazy preacher comes back to it over and over again. It is because the scripture is very clear that this calling that he has when he brings us out of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of his dear son, this kingdom of his dear son is full of the love of God for one another and for God. And it is the lifeblood of every single one of us that we walk in this love. As it says in Ephesians, walk in love. Make it so that you do the things that cause love. This is amazing stuff, and God calls us to it. So, I want to take a look at these words that he uses up here. He uses two different words up here in this passage of Scripture that deals with love. Philadelphia is, uh, we call the city of brotherly love. And I, I, had, I, I was wrong when I was thinking about this. I thought the Adelphia was the city of, and then Phil, Phileo, the, the first one is Philadelphia, is love. And it's not. It's one word. And in the scripture, it is one word as well. It's Philadelphia. It is Adelphos. That's the last part of the word. That means brother. In this case, every believer. Every believer. It's Adelphos. Is that this is the believer that you have before you that says, I'm a be- I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you accept them as your brother. Okay? And so this is the Delphos. This is what he calls us. And then the next one is phileo. The first part of the word is phileo. And this is love. This is the word love. There's three words that are, well, actually there's four words in, in Greek, but we'll only deal with two, two of them. Is uh, the, the agape and the phileo. There's another one called eros, which is basically uh, sexual sensual erotic love. We get the word erotic from it. And th- that's not in the scripture. The only two script words in the scripture that deal with this is, is phileo and agape. Agape is love. Deliberate choice to love. If you go and try to figure out from the other writers of Greek what we the, the Christian means by agape, you will not get it in the classical Greek reading. It becomes a new word in the gospel, in the New Testament. It is a new meaning. They've taken the Greek word and they've pulled it in to mean something more than what even the Greeks meant it to mean. And this is a choice to love. It is a choice to love. 
I choose to love you. I may not have any feelings. The phileo gives the tender affections. And that's what he says. As to the love of the brethren, the tender affection of the brethren, that's what, that, I don't have to, to teach you about that because God teaches you to love one another, to choose to love one another. I choose to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is really not easy to say, okay, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and I obey God in all these things because we know that human beings, when you put them in and you take a stick and you stir them all around, they're going to rub each other wrong, they're going to cause all sorts of issues and they're going to cause hurt in the process. And God says, I don't care how big of a stick it is or how big of a pot it is and how many people are in that pot, I want every single person in there loving each and every single person in that pot. I don't care how bad it is, I want you to love. I want you to choose to love. So if we rewrite the scripture, it says this, Now as to the tender affection you have for each other as fellow believers, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to deliberately choose to love one another. Do you see the difference? He says, Now as to the love of the brethren, this nice, kind, wonderful, loving feeling that we have for each other, I want you to know that God teaches you to choose to love. He teaches you to choose to love. Now, the question we might ask ourselves is, how in the world can I put this into shoe leather? How can I walk in that love? How can I make that decision? And so he asked this question, and the question we might ask, how did God, or does God teach us them us? How did he teach them, and how does he teach us? Well, number one, we can get to the process, is the Word of God. Obviously, every, I would ask that question to you, and you get back. Well, the Bible, would, would God would teach us through the Bible, and He does. That is the primary source that we have of solid biblical understanding of what God's will is, is through His Word. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. <clears throat> uh, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Okay, that's okay. That's good. I get into the Word of God. It is it is adequate to equip me for everything that God wants me to do. The Scriptures is all we need to understand the will of God. But God doesn't leave it just with the Scriptures. He does something else. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He used the prompting of the Holy Spirit, who is given to lead us into all truth. So the Holy Spirit has been placed inside of us. The New Old Testament, they have the Word of God, but they could not live the Word of God. Even if they understood it, they didn't live it. And so therefore God has this new covenant that He's made that He is going to put the law of God not only in the written form, but He's going to put it in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is the one who uses that in our hearts to cause us and stir us up and to understand the things of God. So now when you read the Scriptures, they come alive. They come alive. It's, it is not dead words. It is a living book. And it is able to transform our hearts and our minds and our thinking. And I hope that you've captured this in all the preaching that I've done over the years. Is that I believe that God uses His Word and His Holy Spirit in such a way as to transform hearts. To make you different than what you've ever been before. That you're not any longer that person that was apart from God and lost. But you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And God is doing His work in you to transform you. So, He uses that. But He doesn't stop there only. Those are the two primary things that we have. But He does other things as well. He uses godly counsel. Godly counsel is very important. That you... You're having struggles, that you're, try, you're, you're not quite getting it, you know, as far as things are concerned. And you, you go to somebody that you trust, that's walking with the Lord, and you say, here's my problem. You know, how do I apply this scripture into my life? Or how, what scripture do I apply into my life even? And that person is able to give you count, godly counsel. They take the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they may uh, make it more clear to you. And all of a sudden, you, you get this godly counsel. If you're having trouble in your marriage, get some godly counsel in there. We go through 
four years of college and beyond that even, when we learn a, a trade or whatever it is that we might want to do. We go through all that education. And yet somehow or other, people get into their mind that if a man and a woman get together for a marriage, that they've got all that they need for that marriage to survive and, and, to, and to thrive. Just by accident. I guess it happens by osmosis, right? Just, oh, I know how to be a husband. Oh, I know how to be a father. I know how to be... Th-. No, you don't. It is not easy being that. And we get, uh, we get ashamed that I don't have all the things equipped to do these things. No, don't be ashamed. It's understandable. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things I do in, in marriage counseling. When, sometimes they ask me, you know, what, do you, what is this marriage counseling going to cost me? And I always say $5,000. <laughs> that gets their attention there. And I say, yeah, I... What, what happens is I charge you $5,000, and at the end of the first year, I give you $1,000 back. At the end of the second year, I give you $1,000 back. And at the end of 30 years, I'll give you $3,000 back. So it doesn't cost you anything. Of course, I won't do that, and they won't do that either. But, you know, if you can make it through the first three years, you know, you're motivated. You know, I'm going to get $3,000 at the end of this three years. I can live with this lady for that long. <laughs> you know? But, you know, you get, you got to make it. you got to have a motivation to get to the end of this thing and, and get the information that you have, that you need in the process. And I said there was a second thing that I do, and I don't remember what I do. But I do something. Anyway, well, I, I, one, one of the things is, is I tell them this. If you run into trouble, if you run into trouble, get help early. Get help early. Don't, don't keep on building up hurts and hurts and hurts and hurts. Get help early. But if you, that fails, get help anyway, even if you've built up a lot of hurts. So much times, marriages go through a typical time, and they, and they, and they continue on adding to that instead of stopping and saying, hey, by ourselves we dug ourselves into this hole, and by ourselves we'll dig ourselves out. The only way you're going to do that is dig yourself deeper in. You got to say, wait a second. There's something that God gives to us. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us the ability to start all over again. Let's do it. Let's do it the way God does. So, godly counsel comes into play. Get counsel. If you're having trouble, get counsel. Get strong, healthy, vibrant counsel. I'm not a psychological counselor, but I am a scriptural counselor. Come to me if you need to. I'll give you a scriptural counselor. If you need psychological counselor, we'll, we'll send you somebody that is that is well well equipped there. Whatever we can do to help you become all that you are called to be. That is what we're about. The next thing he does is circumstances. He does use circumstances. All things work together for the good. That means that when something happens in your life that's a circumstance, God uses that in your life to conform you into the image of his son Jesus. And whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing, God uses all things. And like I said uh, the other day at, down at uh, Prairie View Christian Camp, is the Greek word for all is all. All. Get it. He causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. For He has done something to us. He has called us to Himself. He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. God uses all of that, so He uses circumstances to make us like Jesus. But it takes wisdom to see that. Oh, this event occurred in my life, and I can see how God is using that to conform me to Jesus. Understand, you've got to have it in your mind. I am going to be like Jesus when God is done with me. So this trial that came, God is going to turn to a blessing. Whatever it is, God is going to use it as a blessing to me to be more like Jesus. And if it's not meant for me to be more like Jesus, God is going to use my disaster in your life in order that you might be more like Jesus. Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our sufferings in order that we might be able to comfort others with the same comfort which we have received. God never misses an opportunity to use a hurt. God will use hurts over and over and over again to help us be more like Jesus. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it both day and night, 
so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So then you will make the way prosperous and then you will have success. This is a repetitive verse. It is to be repeated over and over again. It is not a verse that says, okay, I read the scriptures once, I thought about it once, and now I did it once, and it's all over with. It is a day-to-day meditation, day and night, from here until all eternity. The scripture in the New Testament does a very similar thing. In Colossians 1, 9 and 10, this is an amazing passage of scripture. It shows us how God takes and trains us to do righteousness. He teaches us how God takes and gives us the ability to do His will. It gives us understanding of the processes that God does. So the first thing He does, He says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. First of all, Paul says, I pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Where do you get that will? Remember, we covered it, right? There's the scriptures, mainly, primarily, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Godly counsel. What, however you come in contact, or circumstances, whatever you come in contact with the will of God in your life, you understand, okay, this is the will of God for my life. Now, there's lots of people that will get the will of God, and they will say, that was nice. And they go do something else. Now, James talks about that. You look into the Word of God, and you see yourself clearly, and then you go and you don't comb your hair or anything else like that. You just go out like you normally are. Most of you ladies don't do that. I know this. I lived with one for a long time, and that she is really upset if she has to leave with her hair all messed up. If she has a bad hair day, it's a bad day, and all that sort of stuff. And so the thing, the idea is that you look at the Word of God and you say, that is the will of God. Second thing he says, in, the, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's the, that's the second thing. Okay, not only do I know what this says, but I have spiritual wisdom and understanding. I deal with this thing. Now, one of the things that you can do in this is get involved with a small group Bible study. Small group Bible study where you can pull in other people's spiritual wisdom and understanding on a certain scripture or whatever it is so you can understand it better. Get involved with a small group Bible study. You will grow leaps and bounds. Gene gave a testimony not too long ago about, about what God did in his life when he just started Bible study and it just ignited his spiritual life. And that is what God wants us to do. But if you can't get there, you still got it within you. You have every spiritual blessing in heaven and places. God has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. God has given you all the spiritual, the promises, all the pr- precious promises of God. They belong to you. You have the word of God written in your heart. You are able to understand the scripture. You are able to do it if you apply yourself to it. Small group Bible studies are coming to church speeds up the process, but you have the ability. Understand that. So that, in all spiritual wisdom you understand, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. So walk worthy. You get the knowledge of who, what God wants you to do. You think about it. You meditate on it. It says in, in, uh, in uh, Joshua 1.8, you meditate on it day and night. You get it down into your heart so that you may be careful to do according to it that you do what God calls you to do. He tells you to do something, you do it. And as a result of that, you're bearing fruit in every good work. That's the, that's the next, next step in the process. You're bearing fruit. Uh, the, uh, the way that Joshua does it, he says, you know, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. But the way the New Testament says, you'll bear fruit. You'll see the result of that in your life. You'll see that happening. This is what God has done for me. That he has, he has given me this truth. I've thought about it. I've done it. And you're going to see results in it. Now, sometimes the results are, are negative. Because not everybody in this world likes to hear about Jesus. And God may call you to do something about, to some, for somebody that doesn't appreciate it. But don't you forget that it is going to be blessed by God. 
if you're obedient, no matter what the results. And then the thing is, you're increasing in the knowledge of God. So you see this cycle that goes along? It goes round and round and round here in the process. I'll give you an example of this. Let's talk about in the process of loving one another. One of the things in loving with one another is to forgive one another. That's on the next slide there. It's uh, forgive one another. So you've come across the scripture, and Jesus is very clear about it, is that we need to forgive. Father, forgive me as I have forgiven others. Jesus goes on to say, for if you do not forgive others, then God and Father will not forgive you. So you know it's seriously business with God that we forgive one another. You understand, that is his will, that I forgive. Got a whole list of people that I need to forgive, and I pull those out that are easy to forgive, and I leave all these others over here, and I say, God, you just don't understand these, these people really have hurt me. And you come across his will. He says, forgive. So you pull some more out. And you say, these guys up over here are really bad people, God. Surely you don't want... Yeah, you do. You want me to forgive. So you, so you say, okay, this thing I'm going, as God has forgiven me, I should forgive. As, that's what Ephesians 4.32 As God has forgiven you, so also you should forgive one another. Oh, let's put it in perspective here. My sins are forgiven completely and I've offended God the way I've offended God all the days of my life before coming to know Jesus and he forgave me all of that. He didn't say up there, but you know, that sinner John, I mean, I, he's really bad. And I am. I won't say just ask Mary because she'll lie. I am. And so I, I, I put it in perspective, and that's spiritual wisdom and understanding. I understand, oh, as God has forgiven me, I should forgive. There's nobody on my list on this side anymore. I forgive. And as a result of that, there's a restoration of fellowship. Now, there's a whole list of things that could happen from your forgiving that may not result in restoration of fellowship. But, uh, but there may be other things that can result from your being obedient by your forgiving others. I, I, you know, you, a whole lot of different blessings that God can do. God can choose all sorts of blessings to send your way as a result of that. But then understand this, that the blessing will come. If you're obedient, the blessing will come. If you're disobedient, then you will not experience the blessing. God doesn't condemn you. God doesn't kick you out of heaven. Uh, he doesn't do that. But you will not experience the blessing of obedience. I told a story this last week, and I think it's appropriate here. I, I remember one time, I knew that God wanted me to go and talk to these kids out in the backyard. I mean, I just knew it in my heart. And I was scared to death of these eight-year-old kids. I was in college, or out of college, really. And I was scared to death of going and talking to these kids. And I didn't obey God. And I have missed that blessing of being obedient, of knowing what God would have done. I might have, you know, might not have nothing happened. But at least I would have been obedient. And I would have known what it would be like to be obedient. And it set my spiritual life back quite a ways. So we need to be obedient to God. And as a result of that, that restoration of fellowship, God does another thing. He gives us new revelation. It might be stop your grumbling. It might be some other thing that he tells us. You know, that you stop, you start studying the scripture, you know, whatever God wants to do in your life. Stop being lonely. Stop being, uh, stop being a jerk. <laughs> whatever it might be that God calls us to do. And you say, okay, now I got a new one from God. A new thing that I know that God wants me to do, I use spiritual wisdom and understanding with that, then I do what God gives me to do, and then I get the blessing, and then God reveals me something new. And we cycle up into the image of Jesus. Every step we see a cycle up. It's a, a building and a building and a building and a building as we go up. And that's the way that God taught his people there in Thessalonica to follow after him in loving one another. As God that God himself teaches you that you ought to love one another. God takes them through the process of educating them into the being the image of Jesus Christ. Okay. Practice makes perfect. 1 Thessalonians 
For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. God is going to teach you how to love one another. He's going to use different methodologies, and uh, not methodologies necessarily, but ne- different, different items that you need to do about forgiving your neighbor or whatever it may be that you need to do. And God will keep growing you in the understanding that it is not about you. It is about being obedient to God. And so, therefore, he says, continue on doing this. Galatians 6, 9 through 10, it says this, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Oh, there's so many things I could tell you about this whole thing. It is amazing stuff that God wants to accomplish in our lives. But anyway, I'm going to go on because we're kind of running around out of time. Set your priorities aright. Set your priorities aright. Get it into your head what you need to do with your life. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. He says, listen, guys, I was with you, and I'm saying to you, it's okay for you to live your lives. It is okay that all of you are not preachers. It's okay that you are not all uh, missionaries to Africa. It's okay that you're not. It's okay to live your life. He says, listen, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Be at peace. To be at peace. Make it your ambition to do that. To be at peace. Go through your life. Be at peace. Don't be fretting your life away. You know, the, the thing is, we are so busy in this world and so many things that are going on in this world. And we can take our kids and get them involved with this and this and this and this. And we're, we're so busy that we can't enjoy one another. We're not peace. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting them involved with this and this. And you ought to be involved with this and this, but maybe not this, this, and this, and this, and this. You see what I'm saying? You know, when it gets to the place where you're not at peace, it's not healthy. And God says, be at peace. Live a quiet life. Don't, don't live a, an exuberant out there uh, destroying yourself in this world life. Be at peace. Make that a, an idea in your home that we're going to have peace. You're going to have time with your husband and wife. And you're going to have time with your kids. And you're going to have time with, with the saints of God. And you're going to have time to love and do the things that God wants you to Be at peace. God has called us to peace. Attend to your own business. What he's saying there is get out of everybody else's business. Don't help me. <laughs> <You know. laughs> They need help for sure, but you know, maybe you need to be invited into their business before you get into their business. Stay in your own business. And work. Work. Work is good. Human beings, uh, men, folk, uh, are made to work. Your identity comes from your work oftentimes. It's not that women don't work. In fact, my, work, my wife works more than always than I wanted her to, and she gets me to do all the things that she can't do, and so I get to do all the work, too, that I do. I, so I'm trying to teach her peace. I'm, te- I'm preaching to Mary here. Mary, be at peace. <laughs> be at peace. Okay. So that, so that, there's a reason we do this, Beha- so that we may behave properly toward outsiders, that they may be able to see that there's something real about being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are the saints of the living God and we carry forth the character and the nature of Jesus himself and the world needs Jesus. And so, and also that you not be in need for yourself. Not to be in need for yourself. Uh, Everywhere the gospel goes, when it really grabs a hold of people's hearts, the people's economic status rises because of this philosophy that we get from Paul here, that I'm called to work. You know, it's not to sit up on the hill waiting for Jesus Christ to come again. That's a great place to be. But he says, get out there 
and work so that you may not be in a need. Now, the, we corporately gather together, and if there is a brother or a sister that is in need, we want to meet those needs. But we teach them, if they don't know already, we teach them that they need to get to the place where they are also able to join the rest of us in helping other people. And that we all move that direction where we are building the body of Christ so that there may be no need among us whatsoever. And so we help each other to get to that place. That's what the saints of God do. But it's okay for you to pursue your wealth. As long as you understand it is wealth that is peaceful wealth. I know that there's some people who asked a wealthy man, said, said, um, when do you know that you have enough? And he says, well, I never have enough. And he's always after more and more and more. If you're after more and more and more, your priorities are messed up. It's okay for you to pursue a healthy, vibrant pursuit of finances. That's okay. God's okay with that. Get out there and work. But don't make it your life. Don't make, it your, don't make yourself a slave to that stuff. What are you called to? I'm called to peace. I'm called to building up and strengthening. I'm called to loving. I'm called to caring. I'm called to, I'm called to making sure that, that, yes, I take care of my family so that they're not in any need, but I also am there to make sure that you're not in any need also, and so that my finances become a part of what I do in life. I'm not a health, wealth, and prosperity preacher. I do not believe that nonsense, that God wants you wealthy. I'm just saying it's okay for you to pursue it. God is not angry with you to pursue a stable life. Not a life in a stable, but a stable life. Got to be careful how I say things. Anyway, uh, that's what Paul says to the Thessalonians. I think he would be saying it to us as well. Get out there and work. It's okay to work. It's fun to work. It's joyful to work. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For the scriptures, I thank you that you've called us to love and that you're teaching us to love and that we don't have any need for a preacher to tell us to love, but that we actually do are taught by you. But we do need a preacher to say, let's excel in it and even more. So, Father, I pray that you will cause us to excel in that love that you have given to us for one another, that we build a church that is strong and vibrant and building up and strengthening of each other, that you might be able to bless and encourage us to walk with you every step of the way. Father, there may be somebody here that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord, and we know that. We pray, Father, for them that they may come to know him and the salvation that he brings by their faith and trust in him by just simply starting that journey. He says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name, that they may place their belief on Jesus right now by simply saying to him, Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my life and receive you as my personal Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from the way I've lived, and I turn to this new lifestyle that you have given to us in your scripture, and I pray that you will lead me and guide me to do it well.